to talk today about a question that keeps me up at night and increasingly is on the minds of disciplines across campuses like this and across the world, and that is, how are we going to energize industrialized countries and pull a billion people out of poverty without overheating the earth? Um, the answer lies clearly in moving toward non-fossil fuels and in using energy more wisely so we can use less of it. And yet, at the same time, all of the official projections call for more fossil fuel consumption, more energy consumption, both internationally and in the United States. So what are we going to do to try to diverge from all of these official projections? Well, we're going to have to tackle both new technologies and new policies at a global, national, state, and local scale. So the uh, forecasts do call for a doubling of energy consumption worldwide over the next half century. And most of that increase is going to occur outside of the United States and outside of, in fact, the European Union. It's going to be driven by the expanding lifestyles and affluence of Asia, of India, China, and the Middle East. The United States, on the other hand, is seen as growing its energy quite slowly. So while 20 years ago we consumed 25% of the world's energy, today we're only at about 15%, and in the future that percentage is going to continue to decrease. So here we are, the United States on the right, growing very slowly, the world's consumption nearly doubling. So how are we going to influence the energy choices of the global population? We used to be able to influence through the power of our own purchasing. Now we're going to have to influence it by showing how one can leapfrog to new technologies. Um, I like to describe how this is going to require that we go on a diet to show the rest of the world how they can lose weight. <laughs> um, oh, this is <laughs> so this diagram shows that uh, the United States is the envy of the world in terms of its growing natural gas and oil uh, production. We're increasing our exports in natural gas, going from an importing to an exporting nation, and we're reducing our uh, oil imports significantly, the envy of the world. At the same time, Japan, China, the EU, are going to be reaching levels of import of gas and oil that are approaching 80 to 100 percent. In particular, Japan is almost at 100 percent already. So with that kind of a context, that is, with so much wealth and prosperity coming to the United States by virtue of its booming fossil fuel industries, how are we going to transform our energy economy? Well, we need to keep into, uh, take into account the uh, climate change forecasts, which on the top level here show business as usual, current policies, bringing us up to a future in which the long-term average temperature will exceed today's by approximately 6 degrees C. Well, no one is willing to accept that, so the Copenhagen Accord which was agreed to several years ago, concluded that we need to drive policies so that we can maximize our, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere at a peak of 450 parts per million and do it quickly so we can turn down our emissions by about 2020 and achieve a maximum, they call it the guardrail, of two degrees C increase. Well, it turns out that we have already committed to a consumption of about 80% of the CO2 that would be allowed with this forecast. We already have in place so much infrastructure that is CO2 and energy intensive. We only have about 20% that we can play with to do a better job. It's becoming clear that a two-degree C future is no longer a possibility. 
And so there is a middle of the road scenario that's called the new policy scenario. This is not business as usual. This is doing things quite differently. But this would take us to about 3.5 degree C increase. What does that mean for us, for instance, here in the southeast? Well, this kind of a, a trajectory that we're currently on, extending into the future, would cause the southeast to be particularly vulnerable in terms of increasing temperatures, extremely um, cataclysmic heat waves, um, sea level rise, and also uh, water, water problems, water shortages, excuse me. If you were to take a look just at um, the area we are in today, which is Knoxville, so you could look at the comparison of a few decades ago to the end of the century, we are going to be seeing a doubling of the number of days that reach 90 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. So just in terms of local effects, it's going to be quite significant. Well, there is a little bit of good news. The world is learning how to use energy more effectively. Um, the circled diagram, excuse me, I'm not doing this very well, <laughs> shows uh, how we're moving from the left to the right. We are using energy more productively. Energy productivity is a measure of economic output divided by energy use. So we are moving in the right direction. But we're also moving up. The chart uh, has as its vertical axis energy intensity, which is energy per capita. The world is using more energy per person as our wealth expands. Most of the European Union and the United States are along this diagram, which shows that over the past 10 years, each, each country is represented by, a, a, by 10 dots. Most of these countries are becoming more productive, and they're also using less energy per capita. On the other hand, we have Russia, China, India, Brazil, and a lot of the developing nations going in the opposite direction. So how are we going to turn that around? The United States, as with many of the uh, European Union countries, uh, have been using energy more wisely. And in fact, if you calculate how much energy we would be using today, if we used it as ineffectively as we did 20 years ago, you would conclude that energy efficiency improvements has been the largest energy resource available to this country since the Arab oil embargo. So here's what we're uh, consuming today. This is the black line here. This is the forecast going up to 2010. If we hadn't improved the efficiency of our energy use, we would be using twice as much energy. So it's kind of a hidden resource. It doesn't get very well documented in the official energy statistics for the country. But this big blue wedge is, in fact, the largest energy resource we've been taking advantage of. Um, we do need to consider the fact that over the same time period, we have offshored the purchase of a lot of our in most energy intensive commodities. We're buying more and more of our products from offshore. And so you need to take into account our impact on the energy being consumed in other countries to provide us with our, the affluence that we're accustomed to. And so you need to remove from that blue wedge the energy we're responsible for um, through the purchasing we make of commodities from other countries. So we're getting more and more sophisticated with how we handle the accounting of national consumption. But uh, there is still much progress that can be made. We are uh, wasting a lot of energy. And this chart puts the energy efficiency opportunity that remains in the United States on a supply curve diagram, which is much like the supply curves that utilities use when they're asking the question, how much should I generate from oil, gas, uh, nuclear, renewables, or coal? Well, here we're asking, how much can I buy at what cost of different types of energy savings? 
So on the vertical axis, we have the cost of that improved increased energy savings. And on the x-axis, we have the magnitude of that savings. So I could uh, bring your attention to, for instance, the two lighting technologies that if we were to improve our use of advanced lighting, so it would be more fluorescence and more solid state lighting instead of incandescence, we would be able to buy that much lighting at that little cost, a whole lot cheaper than the cost of generating electricity through traditional supply sources. So much can be done. Um, many of these efficiency opportunities are enabled by new technologies. So you have, for instance, um, communicating thermostats, where you can set your thermostat at work to be <laughs> so that your home is heated just in time to return to it at the end of the day. And you would be motivated to do this, especially if the utilities would put you onto a dynamic pricing policy where you were charged for the real cost of power when it's consumed at, uh, by time of day. If that were the case, for instance, the utility could help set you up with something like these energy orbs. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, they're too close together. All right, here we go, the energy orb. The energy orb is green <laughs> when um, energy is cheap, and it turns red at times of the day when the energy is pricey. So what an easy way to decide whether or not to run your dishwasher at that point in time. Um, now, for renewables, we do have, in this country, about 5% of our electricity being generated by um, non-hydro renewables, wind, biomass, and solar, for instance. And that's forecast to go up to about 12% over the next 20 years. The question um, here is, who's going to be providing that renewable resource? Is it going to, in the case of solar um, power, is it going to be done through utility-owned solar farms, large-scale solar enterprises that, are, uh, that generate electricity and wheel it back onto the grid and to you and me uh, through its distribution system? Or are we going to see a proliferation of building integrated solar panels, so rooftop panels owned by you and me and by businesses across the, across the country? Um, probably the answer is it's going to be a little bit of both, but utilities don't really like that second distributed system because their business model pays them according to return on equity, which is only profitable if they own the equity <laughs> that um, is uh, in the solar panels. But I do foresee we're going to see a transformation in the utility industry, which is much like what has happened in communications with the introduction of the internet. So many more providers, a more distributed uh, system of renewable resources. And one of the policy instruments that's going to make that happen are state laws that are requiring the minimum, a minimum level of generation of renewable resources. So on the left map, you see that there are 29 states today that have set in place a minimum obligation for utilities to produce a certain amount of renewables. Now, it doesn't uh, span the entire country. And in fact, each state operates quite differently. And so the problem is, how do you grow a renewable energy enterprise when all of the rules are, are different? It's like, how would you have designed a national highway system if every time you drove your car across a state line, you had to change the fuel or you had to change the engine? Well, now we have every state with a different type of solar resource or wind or sometimes uh, solar water heating, which qualifies in one state and not another, or in some instances, no state. Uh, no state standard is in place. 
one, uh, people in the uh, public policy arena are wondering, does that mean that we really ought to have a federal preemption of the role of standardization of renewable resources to try to bring those lagging states? You saw on the maps of the U.S. that very few of the southeast states had these minimum requirements. So why don't we introduce a federal minimum standard for renewables. This would prevent spillover of pollution, where if one state has a lot of coal, the neighboring state with downwind will get the pollution. It also prevents free riders. When one state elects to engage in an aggressive greenhouse gas reduction, then other states can be free riders and just uh, allow the costs to go uh, to others. But on the other hand, if you do preempt through a federal jurisdiction, you're no longer to al allowing the states to play the role of a laboratory of democracy, where states and localities have been inventing new ways, new technologies and new policies. So there's still a, uh, some level of uncertainty of what to do. We don't want to forget that there's a lot of action going on also at the local scale. A lot of cities um, are taking on the climate challenge in new and innovative ways. For instance, in Austin, their state buildings all use only renewable energy. In Boulder, Colorado, they're taking over the electricity system because they're not satisfied with the public, with the private power provider Excel. Um, there are nine cities in which there's a requirement that commercial buildings provide uh, utility data on their energy consumption so that you can have the, uh, the, the uh, market operate more effectively by knowing what's an efficient or an inefficient building. So there's a lot going on at the local scale. The bottom line is optimistic. There is a lot we can do between now and the, and the year 2050. Much of the infrastructure that will be in play at that time has not yet been built, and so we can build it right. Clean technologies are improving. New technologies are available. We have a lot of grassroots efforts, too. Um, carbon emissions are not yet priced in most countries or in most states of the U.S., once there's a price on CO2, we will see more innovation. And uh, while we wait for global, federal, uh, and federal action, states and localities are not standing still. I'd like to end, though, by noting the importance of these grassroots efforts. There's a lot that we can do. and. In fact, there's a lot that we do do. We vote with our feet every day of our lives in shopping malls, in car dealerships, and in the voting booths. So let's do it right. Thanks. <laughs>